Okay, we're at lecture three. Uh, today the goal is to, I uh, hope, advance through the end of the prerequisite material and look at um, possibly exponential functions, 1.5, and also uh, get in the appendix in the back of the book, uh, linear equations, and uh, conic sections. So maybe all of that sounds like review. That'd be wonderful if it is. Um, but I bet you there will be something we do in the appendix in the back of the book that is something you either didn't hit real hard in your high school math class or the predecessor here on campus, Math 111. Um, I bet you we'll hit one of those today. Um, let's finish the prerequisite material. This is going to be faster than I normally go through material, but it's prereq. So uh, we did a piecewise function. I think it was part of a line, and the other part was piece of a uh, parabola. It was a function, kind of almost failed to be a function because we almost had two points in the same vertical line, but one point was included, the other was excluded. Um, we were running out of time at that point. So let me ask this question, which I should have asked yesterday. Um, is there anything that really ever behaves in a day-to-day, real-world situation that really necessitates a piecewise function or a split domain function? Can you think of anything, or is it just some something some geeky math people uh, decided to come up with? I, I, by the way, walking over, actually leaving here, the other day I saw some shirts on people said, Go Greek. You've probably seen them people trying to advertise for fraternities and sororities. I thought of a good math department shirt that would say, Go Geek. And then we put like NCSU math department on the back. Does that sound pretty good? <laughs> I, I thought that would work. I'm not going to print any up because they probably wouldn't sell. Um, so is anything really like a piecewise function? Hmm. Think of anything that behaves a certain way for a while and then there's a kind of an abrupt change in <coughs> second elements, and then it behaves that way for a while, and then it, another abrupt change, and it behaves. Um, Mark? Yeah, I would say stuff in like physics. If an uh, object falls, it'll be accelerating, but then it'll eventually reach its terminal velocity, and it'll stay, stay at the same velocity. OK. So it'll increase in velocity, right? to a point in time where it reaches its <coughs> terminal, velocity. terminal velocity, the fastest that it could ever go. So uh, maybe something like this, and then it reaches that terminal velocity, and then it levels out, right? That's part of a curve and then part of a line. You ever bought anything in bulk where if you buy one through 11 items, it's a certain price, and if you buy 12, to 30 items, it drops down. Yeah. You get a better deal if you buy more of something. That's really a split domain function. So if you buy um, 1 through 11 of them, you get this price, whatever that is, 11.95. If you buy 12 to 23, you get a lower price per item. Is that a piecewise function? Yeah. yeah kind of a little step function. And then if you buy any more than that, you pay the same price per item. So price reduction for bulk purchasing, that's a piecewise function. You ever ridden in a taxi cab? Yeah. That's a piecewise function. Because as soon as you get in the cab, don't you owe a certain amount of money? Right? And then it's for every, what, fifth of a mile? Something like that. It's a, it's an, so it's incremental. So it, it is, if you plotted it, it would be a piecewise function. Uh, a lot of things are actually piecewise functions. They behave a certain way for a while, and then they behave differently from that point. So we do have a need for things like that. Um, absolute value function. So we come across that occasionally. and different versions of an absolute value function. So it might just be our old friend, that little V-shaped graph. In calculus, we need to be able to 
rename this slightly. Problems that we'll be doing later in um, this course will be finding areas under curves. So an absolute value function looks like this, but we can't in calculus differentiate an absolute value, nor can we integrate an absolute value. So we have to rename this by pieces. This piece that starts at the origin and goes up here and bisects the um, first quadrant, what's a good name for that? Bob? Steve? No, not that kind of name. <laughs> like an equation. <laughs> We can give it a name, but I mean, we want to give it a mathematical type name. Y equals X. Isn't that Y equals X? It's not the whole thing, but that's the part of it that we want is Y equals X. This part over here is Y equals negative X. Does that sound familiar at all, by the way? Yeah. Isn't that the definition of absolute value? Mm -hmm. Absolute value of X is X. If x is greater than or equal to zero, it's the negative of x if x is less than zero. That's the definition. So that definition actually corresponds to a physical diagram that will be helpful to us later. So when you differentiate and integrate, the process is not sophisticated enough to handle absolute value, so we have to rename it into its component pieces. Um, Symmetry. Let's finish, well, for the most part, the work part will be um, finished from, I think this is still the first section. Yes. Um, even and odd functions. Do you remember anything about an even function? <coughs> same, on Same on both sides of the x-axis? The y-axis, OK? So an even function would have symmetry to the y-axis. Does that sound right? So if I've got this point. Uh, let's say, I'll try to keep it generic, we're over A units and we're up F of A units. What is the other point, what is its symmetric image that must be a part of this set if it is even? Negative A. Negative A, F of A, right? So even says if you put in A into the function or negative A, into the function, you get the same thing back. Right? <coughs> the f of a equals the f of negative a. Or in general, the f of any x value is equal to the f of the negative of that x value. If that's true for a function, that's an even function. What about cosine of x? Is that an even function? Uh, some of you are kind of cringing when I put trig examples up here. Get used to it, because I'm going to be throwing a lot of trig up here, because this course and this uh, following courses are very trig intensive. So cosine, can you get a mental picture of what a cosine looks like? Does that have this kind of symmetry? Mm -hmm. Yes. Does it have that symmetric balance about the y-axis? No. It does. So that must be true if the f of x is it equal to the f of negative x? Is the cosine of any angle equal to the cosine of the negative of that same angle? That's true, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Cosine of pi over 6 is exactly the same as the cosine of negative pi over 6. Yeah. Cosine yes. of pi over 2 is exactly the same as the cosine of negative pi over 2. So we've got this nice little picture of the cosine. And it does possess this kind of symmetry. This, if we folded this thing up on the y-axis, 
the two parts would match up. So it, it is symmetric to the y-axis, therefore it is an even function. Okay, what is true if a function is odd? What type of symmetry does that possess? Uh, Not to the x-axis now. The origin. The origin. The origin. It, now let's go back to that previous answer. And it's okay to have wrong answers in here. All, you've seen me already have wrong stuff up here. We'll just correct it. Not a big deal. Um, symmetry to the x-axis. If it had symmetry to the x-axis, could it be a function? No. no. So there's, there's a problem. We're not going to really graph much in here that is symmetric with respect to the x-axis. But odd will be symmetric with respect to the, to the origin. So I'm probably going to be a little too cluttered on this sheet. Um, we will find out, and I'll draw a picture, that the f of negative a will be the negative of the f of a in order for this to possess this kind of symmetry. Is this, is this new for you, or is this, for the most part, review? Nice review? Because I'm kind of seeing some mixed expressions here that um, maybe it's been a while. Maybe that's why I'm getting that, that look. All right, so let's get a picture of an odd function. Some of you are thinking, aren't they all odd? Well, I guess you could say in a certain sense they are. So there's our point A, F of A. What is its symmetric image on the other side of the origin? Um, negative, negative F of A. Negative A. Negative A. Negative, 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 negative F of A. Okay, so we're going to come over here, negative A, and come down here, negative f of a. So there's its symmetric image. So if you drew a line segment from the first point to its symmetric image, the origin would bisect it, right? So we know what these kind of graphs look like that, that have this kind of, here, here would be an example, something that looks like this, and its symmetric image would be down here, right? So just as far, let me clarify one thing here, too, because my diagram isn't the best. Uh, as far as we went up to get to this point, we go down just as far. So that's, we went up f of a to get here. We're going to go down f of a to get to this point. So that's why it's negative f of a. So if you put in negative a into the function, you should get the negative of the f of a. Is that correct? When you put negative a into the function, you better get the negative of the original y value. And that creates this kind of symmetry to the origin. So that is an odd function. Uh, I gave you an example of an even function. Somebody give me an example of an odd function. Sine of x? Uh, I got too many bad looks when we did trig. Let's not do sine of x. It is odd. Well, what, what is it x cubed? X cubed? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, would a tangent, a period of tangent, be um, be an odd function? Um, let's do that after this. Okay. Okay. So we'll. <coughs> so y equals x cubed. Is the f of negative x the negative of the f of x? That's, there's our test. Okay. If that's true, then it is an odd function and it does possess symmetry with respect to the origin. So the f of negative x, well, we put negative x for x into the function. Is that the negative of the f of x? Well, the f of x is just x cubed, right? We'll negate the original f of x, so we're negating x cubed. If we put negative x in and cube it, do we get the same result? Yeah, when you cube a negative, don't you get a negative? Yeah. Right? So this is really negative of x cubed, which is, last time I checked, neg the same as negative x cubed. So it is true. So this is an odd function. 
Now, the nice thing about it is it has a nice odd exponent, right? See that nice little correlation there? Uh, in the same manner, x to the fourth, you would expect that to be even, or x to the fourth minus x squared, even, right? Tangent of x. By the way, isn't this a rough picture of y equals x cubed right here, the dotted line graph? So we've kind of already got that little mental image going on that it does have this kind of symmetry. Tangent of x, we've got problems at pi over 2. We have the same problem over here at negative pi over 2. Pi over 4, we should be at 1. Negative pi over 4, we should be at negative 1. It's kind of having that look, isn't it, of this kind? So tangent is going to look something like this. What do you think? Odd? Yes. Odd function. The tangent of x is, excuse me, the tangent of negative x is the negative of the tangent of x. So it's an odd function. Part of what we will analyze in graphs using calculus is we'll try to determine where they're increasing, where they're decreasing, where they're kind of flattened out, either like a relative max or a relative min, and uh, things about the shapes of graphs. So if we have a function that looks like this, some cubic polynomial, and we'll talk about polynomials in just a second, kind of generically. We want to be able to describe and use calculus to help us find where the graph is increasing. I think we briefly touched on this um, yesterday in here. The slopes at individual points change. But on this part of the graph, as you read a graph from left to right, like you're reading sentence in a book. Um, this piece of the graph right here is increasing. What about the slopes of the tangent lines? They're, well, not increasing, decreasing. They're positive, right? All those red lines are positively sloped. Therefore, the curve is increasing. And those two things are kind of tied together. We can't separate those two. At this point, where the graph is not increasing, nor is it decreasing, what's the slope of the tangent line to that curve? Zero. Zero. So those are going to be some important points. We will want to find where the slope of the tangent line is zero, possible turning point. Same thing here, the slope of the tangent line is zero. I'm going to skip that middle part. Let's come back over here. There's the slope of the tangent. There's the slope of the tangent. The curve is doing what? Increasing, what are the slopes? Positive. Positive. Positive slopes means the curve is on its way up. And the part that we skipped is this part in here. These slopes are what? Negative. Those are negative, right? So if the slopes of the tangent lines are negative, the curve is going to be falling from left to right. It's decreasing. So the idea of slopes... and there's not a better definition or description, then rise over run is going to be critical to determining the shape of the curve where the slopes are positive. The curve is going to be increasing where the slopes are negative. Now, where the slope is zero, we might have one of these high points. By the way, that's not absolutely the highest point on the graph, is it? Mm -hmm. No, it's the highest point in that general vicinity. So we'll call that a relative max or a local max. Same thing here. The slope is zero. Not absolutely the lowest point on the graph, but it's the lowest point in this vicinity. So that's a local min or a relative min. Um, so where the slope is zero, 
this is not very exact sounding, but the curve at that instant is flat. It's not increasing, nor is it decreasing. It doesn't have to be a high point, nor a low point. It could do something like this. Comes in here, it gets flat, and it is exactly flat there. But it leaves here fairly flat and does something like this. The slope of the tangent line is still zero right here. At that instant, it's not increasing, nor is it decreasing. But it is not a relative max, nor is it a relative min. Is that correct? For this general vicinity of the graph, is this point the highest point in that locality? It's not. Is it the lowest point in that locality? It's not. So it's not a relative max, nor is it a relative min. That has a name. You might know what that's called when it kind of comes up to that point, flattens out, and then leaves there fairly flat, but continues to increase. Here's a hint. This shape right here is distinctly different from this shape right here. This is concave down. That's point concave up. Uh, that's called a point of inflection is what that's called. Now, we'll hit that much harder later, but I like to at least touch on those things early in the course, and then we, when we revisit them, they're not completely new. So you're not responsible for that yet, but at some point in time in this course, you'll be responsible for uh, knowing what a point of inflection is and knowing how to find it. Okay, a polynomial. something like that. Hopefully a lot better than that. It's got too many letters in it. Uh, some things to clarify. All these exponents, n and n minus 1 and 2 down to 1, down to, there's an understood x to the 0 in the last term. So the exponents are non-negative integers. So x to the seventh, x to the eleventh, x to the fifth, x cubed, x squared, x. All those things, as long as those are um, non-negative integers for exponents, that's a polynomial. So if an example or a couple of examples. 5x to the fourth minus 13x plus 8. Okay, there's a polynomial. Now, it's a kind of a hideous polynomial, but it's a polynomial. That's a polynomial. That's pretty darn simple polynomial. And even simpler than that, that's a polynomial. That's a constant function. We know what that is. Nice horizontal line, but that still fits into here. All these terms are gone. You just have your a sub 0. So the a's here are coefficients. And the n's are exponents, but the exponents have to be non-negative integers. So a non-example f of x equals x to the two-thirds. That exponent is not a non-negative integer. It's not an integer. Two-thirds. So that's not a polynomial. There will be some issues present when we deal with this function that we don't have to contend with with these three or any other polynomial. Now, why are polynomials such a big deal? Let me give you another non-example. 8 over x. That's not an awful function to graph, but it's not a polynomial. This has a discontinuity. Where's the discontinuity in 8 over x? 
zero. at x equals zero. We don't have any of that here. <coughs> you'll never have any discontinuity, and you'll never have any abrupt changes in direction like corners or cusps. That's the nice thing about polynomials. No discontinuities, and I guess to fit it in here, where I've got the available space, it's they're smooth. They're smooth in the sense that they have gradual transitions. Continuous and smooth. So that's why if we have polynomials, and most of the time with the examples, we're going to start with polynomials because they're going to be easier to work with. Then we'll advance to things like this and this that aren't polynomials. So when I say smooth curves, things like this. Nice kind of smooth transitions from increasing to decreasing and decreasing to increasing. You won't, this would be a polynomial. So something that is not a polynomial would be something like that. That's an abrupt change in direction right there. All of a sudden it's decreasing, it gets steeper and steeper and steeper, stops, and now it starts to increase and it's pretty steep as it's increasing. So this would not be a polynomial. Tell by just looking at the graph that it's not. No corners, no cusps, <coughs> no discontinuities, polynomials. I could be corny and say that polynomials are our friends because they behave so nicely. Uh, I don't have very many friends, so I'm kind of glad that I have polynomials occasionally. <laughs> when it's, you know, it's kind of it's tough and times are tough, uh, I'll call on a polynomial and uh, they'll bail me out. I told you it'd be corny. Sorry. <laughs> um, Rational functions. It is the quotient of two polynomials. So we've got some f of x polynomial over some g of x polynomial. Don't expect the quotient of two polynomials to behave like a polynomial. This is not a polynomial. And you can guess why. Now we've got this polynomial down here in the denominator and we've got to be careful that this in fact could be division by zero which very certainly changes things and can keep something from being a polynomial. Now, you might say, will it ever be a polynomial? Yeah. In certain circumstances, let's say we have 3x squared plus 2x plus 1, and it's divided by 5. Well, 5 is technically a polynomial, but it's not linear, it's not quadratic. So you could rewrite this in such a way that it isn't, doesn't even look like a rational function, 3 fifths x squared plus 2 fifths x plus 1 fifth. So that really technically is still a polynomial. But it doesn't necessarily have to be, and most of the time it will not be. So, quotient of two linear functions. Certainly not a line. We could plot some points on this. Uh, we will certainly expect it to not be a line because we have a vertical asymptote and some discontinuity. Where does that occur? One half. At x equals one half? Yes. So that's certainly not polynomial-like and certainly not linear-like. So whatever the sketch of this looks like, I don't know, that might be kind of interesting to see kind of where we are at this point in time in this class. So we've got a vertical 
Everybody feel comfortable finding that you, vertical asymptote? Yes. Can yes. You go over how to do that? Okay. Again? Wouldn't it be a problem in this function if we had division by zero? Yes. Right? So if 2x minus 1 were equal to zero, we can't plot any points in that vertical line. So when does that occur? x equals a half, right? So we're not going to plot any points there, and in fact, it's one of those boundaries that causes the graph to be highly distorted on either side. Mm. All right, this is probably not fair, but I'm just trying to see where we are. Does this, this have any Horizontal asymptotes. Is there a horizontal boundary for this curve? Mm -hmm. no. Some of you are saying there there is one. Where is it? Three halves. Somebody said it. Three halves. Three halves. Tony said three halves. Okay. Yeah. How'd you get that, Tony? Mm -hmm. How did you get that? How did you know it was three halves when you looked at that function? I just knew because um, the exponents of the first function were the same. Okay, so that's part of it. There's an x to the 1 over x to the 1, so they have the same degree, numerator and denominator. Is that ringing a bell a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So they have the same degree. How do you pick off kind of a shortcut version? How do you pick off the horizontal asymptote? Leading coefficients. Leading coefficients. Okay. So 3 over 2. Now, I don't know if you can visualize this. I'm not going to put in a bunch of points on this. But if you put in values for x that were tremendously large, let's say 600 trillion for x, the fact that you add 5 to that, does that really? I mean, if you had $600 trillion and I gave you a quarter, you probably wouldn't stop to even take put it in your hand would you mm -hmm. no eventually when x gets huge doesn't this become insignificant the yeah. same way that that does yes yeah. so what's three times some huge number over two times some huge number it's just three over two right mm -hmm. so that's a shortcut version of where that comes from so as x approaches infinitely large numbers y approaches three halves So there's our two boundaries. If the horizontal asymptote is an issue with you now, don't worry about that. Vertical asymptote, you need to know how to find that. Um, let's say we want to sketch this. How would you sketch this? Now, we're not going to turn on our calculator. We're not going to depend on that. They're wonderful little tools, but we need to know how to do this stuff ourselves without the calculator. Aren't there two possibilities here? Couldn't the graph do this or this, right? That's the only way it could exist over here. And by the way, it does exist over here. What's the only x value for which it does not exist? One half. So any other x value I put in, there will be a y value. So it's got to be up here and use these two asymptotes or down here and use these two asymptotes. I don't know. Which one? Let's plot a point. I know which point I want to plot. Zero. I want to plot the intercepts. Mm. You don't want to? Okay. Nobody really responded to me. <laughs> it's okay if you talk to me. Um, so let's find intercepts. How do we find the y-intercept? Set x equal to 0. I heard somebody say that. So let's go back to the original function. If x is 0, what's y? Negative 5. Negative 5? Yep. Is that right? So 0, negative 5. Now I know where that graph is. I only had two choices over there. One of them was up here. I don't think it's that one. Right? This little graph up here, it's not that one. It's got to be this one because I've got to catch this point. Yeah. Got to contain that point. Yeah. 
So there's the graph just based on one point and the intercepts. Um, let's find the x-intercepts. Probably should have done that before I found that piece of the graph, but I, hopefully it will validate that. So the x-intercepts we set y equal to 0. I will ask this question 500 times this semester. How do you make a fraction 0? With 0 in the denominator? 0 in the numerator. 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 Okay, You make a fraction 0 by making its numerator 0. So. 3x plus 5 is equal to 0, and x is equal to what? Negative, Negative 5, five thirds. thirds. Yeah. There it is, right there. Okay. Negative 5 thirds, 0. So that did kind of further validate that little part of the graph. Now, are there any other asm excuse me, any other intercepts on this function? Be. There should not be if we were thorough. We set x equal to zero. We only got one value. Okay, we set um, y equal to zero. There's only one x value that caused that to happen. This is it. This, these are the only intercepts. So where's the rest of the graph? Let me give you the two choices. It's either got to be here or here? There. The up one or the down one? It's got to be up here because if I drew in this one, what would happen? It would intersect the x-axis and there aren't any more intercepts. We can't create intercepts just because we want them to be there. So there aren't any, so it's got to be up here. So there's a sketch without really a whole lot of information. We found the two intercepts, the two asymptotes, and now we know exactly where it is. And when we get to calculus, doing some calculus, we'll even have to find out less information because calculus will give us some of the information that we need that we didn't come up with here. So if this is an issue with you, horizontal asymptotes, don't let it bother you right now. We'll come back and revisit that. Intercepts, hopefully you feel comfortable with that. How to find intercepts is something that you're expected to know at this point in time. Um, skip over that. Take a quick look at exponential functions. Probably all like y equals 2 to the x a little bit better than 3 to the x, but they're exponential functions. Uh, the typical shape of an exponential function is something like this. So whether it's 2 to the x or 3 to the x, it has that kind of shape. If it's the so that would be a, a growth model, an exponential growth model. And we may not need it all. Maybe we just need this portion from here out to the right. And that could be a variety of things we could model with that kind of a shape. Um, gas prices we could model with that kind of a shape. Uh, that they are, you know, kind of almost rising exponentially. I know we've had a little bit of decline lately, but the bigger picture is that gas prices are doing that. Home prices. Um, a lot of things grow. Population grows exponentially. It may not like be that steep, but it does tend to grow exponentially because as there are more people, there's more opportunity for them to have little people, um, if you know what I mean. So population grows exponentially. Question or issue? Somebody? Uh, yes? Um, is that point at 1 on the y-axis? That's 1, yes. Okay. Yeah, and that will be in common regardless of the base. So if it's base 2 or base E or base 5 or base 10, 
if it's an, uh, a growth type function of this nature, it'll go through that point. Unless it has a coefficient out in front which alters that, the fact that it goes through that point. Exponential decay would be its symmetric image over here. Somebody give me an example of an exponential decay equation. How would I change, let's say, e to the x and make it look like this? E to the negative x. E to the negative x. Yeah. Good. Thanks. E to the negative x. So if you see the exponent negated, it's going to have a negative rate of increase. Well, a negative rate of increase is actually falling. So that would be a decay function. This value e, that's kind of a strange number. It pops its head up in math classes all the time, especially calculus. Um, what is that approximately? 2.71. 2.718. It would be a kind of a handy three decimal approximation to hang on to for the value of e. And we'll talk about a definition of E a little bit later. This is a brush the surface kind of thing. So let's say we had a function. That looked like that. I'm just making it up as I go. That would have one of these shapes. That would probably be a decay, right? Because of the negative exponent. You might care to talk about what you remember from past math classes about this coefficient of x. This is really kind of this model. Remember that yeah. guy right there? So that coefficient of t, or in this case x, wasn't that a rate? So that's the rate of increase. Well, in this case, it's actually a rate of decrease. So this is a declining or a decay function. So something is, maybe this is a half-life. You've got this nasty radioactive substance, and it's decaying at a certain rate. Um, that occupies that position, right, which is the initial amount of money if it happens to be continuously <coughs> compounded interest or the initial amount of bacteria in the culture, whatever. That's the kind of the present value, what we start with. So you've seen functions like that, and this, is, this would be an exponential function, and, it's, and this particular function is a decay function. How do you get from exponential functions to logarithmic functions? What are they to one another? Exponential functions and logarithmic functions. Right now, is that inverse? So let me let me just give an example. Y equals e to the x. There's a pretty basic exponential function. How do we get its corresponding logarithmic function? You log log a. A. Take the log. In this case, natural log, right? Because this is the natural exponential function. It's base e. So if we take the natural log of both sides, what are you really doing? Canceling the natural. Well, let's not cancel, OK? Um, they, they do kind of, this one knocks this one out, which that's fine ultimately to do that. But when you take the natural log of something, what are you really trying to find? The value of the base Let's say, the, I mean, off to the side, let's do this problem. Natural log of 8, what do you, when you punch that into your calculator, it gives you a number. What is that number? <laughs> is it log base 10 to the 8? No. no. Sorry. Well, natural log. This is, so it's got to be, can't be base 10, it's got to be base E. Mm -hmm. But let's take your thought, translate it to base E. Say what you said again and without a base 10 in it. Uh, 
Okay. Is it log E? Okay. So, somebody tell me from your calculator, what is the natural log of 8? Isn't that the exponent that makes it exponential? 2.079. Okay. Roughly. That's not exactly, but I'll keep the equation there. Doesn't that mean that E to the 2.079 yes. is 8? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you're finding the natural log of something, you're finding the power that you would raise E to get that number. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the, this, here's why I like that stuff. I, I like to go back to the like the very foundation and definition of stuff. Because then questions answer themselves. If I know what natural log is, I'm searching for a natural log. I'm looking at this right here. And I'm asking myself the question, sorry, microphone here. Um, what power do I raise E, see if this question doesn't answer itself. What power do I raise E to get E to the X? Doesn't that answer itself? What's the name of your brother whose name is Bob? Well, I believe that would be Bob, wouldn't it? Yeah. What power do you raise E to get E to the X? You raise E to the X to get E to the X. Now, there are other ways of getting there, but hopefully that's all the way back to what <coughs> natural logs mean rather than just say, okay, I want to bring the x out in front and the natural log of e is 1. That's another way of getting there. But the power you raise e to get e to the x has got to be x. So we've got what is, what is x in this case? x was the exponent here. Well, let's describe what x is. x is a natural log, right? So they are related, clearly related, exponential functions and logarithmic functions. Now, they actually, I didn't hear anybody say this, but they, and you might have, I just didn't hear it, they are inverses of one another, right? Did anybody say that and I didn't hear it? Okay, sorry. So, how do you find an inverse? Let's finish up with this today. So our original function is y equals e to the x. Remember how to find an inverse. No, that'd be the reciprocal, which came up yesterday. That'd be the reciprocal. Switch x and y. So here's the inverse x equals e to the y. And what's the next thing we do to find the inverse? Solve for y. So that's kind of a little bit of a bear to solve for y. Let's take the natural log of both sides. I don't know, some of you may not need to do this step, and that's fine. You say, well, what is y? Y is the power that we would raise e to get x. Let me translate that English sentence into a mathematical sentence. Y is the power that you would raise e to get x. What is y? Y is a logarithm. Exponents are logarithms. Let's do it this way, because I can tell by your expression you didn't like it that way. Um, natural log of e to the y. What power would we raise e to get e to the y? y. To the y. Why, <coughs> did you ask? Oh, why is the answer. <laughs> so there's the inverse. So there's the original function. Y equals e to the x. What is its inverse? Y equals natural log of x. Those are inverses of one another. So if um, this is, let me go outside of the box here. If this is f of x, that's f inverse. Don't call that f to the negative first because it isn't, right? That's just a notation that's used. That's f inverse. And where are logs helpful? And we'll stop with this question. Where, where would a logarithm or knowing or using logarithms, how would that ever be helpful? The exponents are too big for your calculator. Uh, okay. In fact, exponents in general. You've got a variable in the exponent. So let's say... Um, What did I have just a minute ago? Something like that, right? And you want to solve that for x? 
you're going to have to use logs to do it, right? If you've got a variable in the exponent, the only way you can get out of that predicament is to take base 10 logs or natural logs of both sides. All right, so we didn't get to 1.5 or the appendix, but we're done with the review material. So have a nice weekend, and I will see you on Monday.